Welcome to Game Woman, a collaborative storytelling collective building a world one game at a time. This week, we will be playing Quest by the Adventurers. If you like what we do here and want to get involved, follow us on Twitter at Game Woman, where you can join our Discord and check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash game. Previously, on the Game Woven Podcast, four travelers defied good warnings and made their way to the town of Finchin in the perpetually rainy gloom of the Blood River Valley. Juniper Junebug Ramos, a grand matronly herbalist, her twin, the scholar of the Undying Empire, Reginald Ramirez Ramos, Gubin the Adequate, a performing magician, and Carbon Alter Ego, a spy and thief. They crossed the river via the knifeway and made for the cask of bronze. The bar was frequented by brazen, magically enhanced warriors who claim inheritance of the Blood River Bend, and are often conscripted by the Undying Empire to be deployed where the fighting is thickest and the most dire. Serious and superstitious, most were unimpressed by Gubin and his clouds of glitter. Fortunately, the recommendation of Gubin's biggest fan was enough to win them a deal, mandatory brazen attendance of Gubin's show, coin and supply, and the guidance of one of the valley's famed runners as far as Fort Wespus. All they need to do is enter a newly uncovered tomb and secure the weapons inside. I will say that whether or not you take the ferry or the bridge, it really isn't of any consequence. You've already done the bridge once. The ferry is relatively safe because the the driver is sober at the moment, so you're in good shape there. It is at that point you begin to press north, um, heading deeper into the woods. Junebug, do you have any like naturalist stuff that helps you out in the in the woods? Let's see. I have some stuff that will help us out in the woods, but most of it is, well. I guess help is a relative term. (laughs) (laughs) I can shapeshift into an animal form. (laughs) That's kind of sick. That's pretty cool. That's really cool. Mm Mm-hmm. That's about it, though. Okay. If you don't have anything specific, Junebug, since you're the naturalist, would you roll me 20 for navigating through this stuff? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Natural 20, baby. Yay! Nice. All right, all right. Atrium. So navigating these woods is very easy and you are able to circumnavigate several what would have been potentially dangerous obstacles. One of note is tucked in between two of the hills. You see at the base of it with roots kind of jutting out a makeshift little stream running underneath a tall old tree. And upon closer inspection, you notice that every single one of the branches and sticks and twigs at the end of this tree, which has very few leaves, are literally tipped with bronze spear tips. Oh, wow. And as you give it a little, a nice wide berth, you notice that it kind of sways in your direction as if trying to lean in a little close. You notice that grass underfoot is hard and brittle. It doesn't bend under your feet. It kind of like breaks and crumples as if it was made of rusted metal. It doesn't penetrate the thickness of your boots, but you get the feeling that if you walked through this barefoot, like you, your feet would get mangled by this grass. It's nasty. Like this whole terrain, it's like it's built to kill you. It is exceedingly hostile. The final thing that you notice before getting 
to the tomb entrance because with your 20, this is just criminally easy for you to handle is you do notice that the, in one of these trees that has a weapon prominently wrapped up in its branches, you notice that sleeping in that tree is what appears to be some kind of a mountain lion or perhaps a puma. The thing that's frightening about it, and it pays you no mind as you walk by, you're able to get people through exceedingly quietly. It's got two long saber teeth. And when I say saber teeth, I mean it's literally got curved blades like jutting out from where its canines would be. The heck is wrong with this place? <laughs> I absolutely love it. <laughs> it's wonderful. Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> oh wait, wait, we're around we're away from the big crowd, so oh no. <laughs> <laughs> until finally you reach the third hill and as promised at the base of this third hill is what appears to be a stone door with an inscription on it that was uncovered by the evidence of a landslide from some flooding that happened here so this tomb was buried either naturally or on purpose and has been revealed recently i don't know about you all but that that was Wonderfully vivid and well described. Walking through the, <laughs> the last five minutes of our of our life, that was. You're welcome. Thank you, Gubin. <laughs> Thank you, Gubin. That was really nice. So much glitter and the, and the narration of the. Yeah. Oh, oh, wonderful! Recklessly approached the door, <laughs> as <laughs> just running straight at it. Yes, door, door. Let's go. Adventure time, my friends, my dearest companions. To adventure! <laughs> He's a rogue, also, by the way. <laughs> Getting up to the inscription of the door, it's definitely a language that you know, but it's like the old-timey version of it. Ah, yes. So there's a lot of, like, excess letters and maybe a couple of characters that you can sort of figure out what they mean in context, but, like, you're not familiar with this alphabet. Ye old dungeon door. Yeah, ye old. <laughs> it just says... Welcome to the dungeon. We got fun and games. It does not say that. <laughs> Dang it! <laughs> Sorry. Oh, wonderful. For the second time this night, I am disappointed. <laughs> I keep doing that. I'm sorry. I am appointed. The inscription says, I'm going to do my best with this here, but it simply says, O ye soldiers and sinners, pay homage here. Forget not our hero, General and then the name is all marred out and scratched, so you actually can't, you, there's no way to figure out what the name is. I'm gonna call him Lucy for now. General, General Lucy. Lucy. <laughs> what is the door made out of? Stone. Memory. Smaller door. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's made of adventure. Well, it does, the this, this stone door does say pay homage here, so my first thought is either blood or some sort of a weapon to pay homage to get through this door. And he cuts his hand and puts the blood on the door. Oh, jeez. Okay. Yeah. Slice. Just gotta I try. I suggest some glitter. Glitter? And as oh. he's like holding, putting blood on the door, probably nothing happening. He's like, that would have been a much smarter way to approach this. Owie, that maybe did not Maybe we could good. throw some glitter on top of the blood. Both Carbon and Gubin are not the ones who wait. So Carbon was like, slice hand, and Gubin was just like, glitter. <laughs> Carbon, roll me 20. <laughs> <laughs> to see if you get glitter in your bloodstream. Oh, no. <laughs> maybe that's like, maybe He's I'll be one like. one of the glitter blooded. <laughs> yeah. I'm like festive Spider-Man. I got bit by a glitter spider. 14. <laughs> oh, but I love it, though. <laughs> Could use fire out glitter I'm trying, trying to fly with webs, but it's just streams of glitter. I'm like, this is useless. I can't do anything. <laughs> Yo, Goobin, Goobin would just sit in a corner and cry. If you could just produce glitter like that, he would just cry. <laughs> or he would cool. kidnap you and force you to just produce glitter all the time. Maybe a glitter Spider-Man is what lives in your pocket already. Oh. <laughs> Maybe that's where the glitter comes from. Mm. Yeah, I just have a little glitter that just farts. Uh, a little spider that farts glitter. 14. So, Carbon, you do the blood thing, and then, like, some glitter gets splattered on the door, and then, like, as you're smearing the blood and feeling... With each inch that you smear the blood, you feel a little more and more silly. Until finally, 
your hand grazes what appears to be a handhold, and you could probably just slide this thing open. I think in in the classic sneaky rogue situation, he would notice the handle, like move to where he's like a little bit in front of it, and be like, it worked, and like unlock the door <laughs> <laughs> and push it open. <laughs> With your 14, I will say that no one actually catches your subterfuge. And Wonderful. For all intents and purposes, they think that you solved that puzzle. Reginald Ramirez Ramos is very impressed. Ah. Very, very impressed. That's like, wow. Oh, I didn't know that could be happening. Just writes that down. Gubin's pretty <laughs> sure the glitter helped. It, it was a combination of ancient glitter magic and, and ancient blood magic combination. <laughs> Just, it, I've adventured so, so much. <laughs> no. Sally forth. <laughs> Does anyone have a band-aid or some sort of... Is there a doctor in the house? Is there a doctor in the house? I'm going to heal. I'm going to use my little, you know, heal thing here and fix fix it. Yeah. What kind of medicines do you use, doctor? It is magic medicine. Magic medicine. It flows through me. Okay. Actually, you know what? I'm going to make... I'm going to have fun with it. I'm going to take a piece... Not a piece. A strand of my hair from my beard. Ooh. And I'm going to place it on the wound, and that would heal. That would heal it. Oh, very cool! I love, I love that. that. So it's like, so there's a long, thin cut on the hand, and like yeah. you sort of like set the hair in there, and then the wound stitches itself up around the hair. That's yes. really cool. And now a part of you is a part of Carbon too. Oh. Carbon puts a hand on your shoulder and says. I'm very edgy. <laughs> I've not had a, lot, had a lot of friends. This is the nicest thing that anyone has ever done for me. I will fight to the death, not with you, but for you. <laughs> Thank you, dearest, dearest friend. Dear <laughs> cool. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Junebug, character question for you. Yes? How many strands of Reginald's hair are set into your flesh over the many, many years that you have been around each other. <laughs> 142. Oh my God. Wonderful. <laughs> you are mostly That's how hair at this now. point. You weren't twins before the hair. Yeah. Now you're twins. You didn't even know each other, but over the years, <laughs> you have just been grafted into twins. <laughs> uh. <laughs> I am into that detail so much. It's wonderful. <laughs> Once again, accidental foreshadowing from Gliza. Just, just oh. completely. I need everyone to know that the players really know nothing about this world other than some primers that I threw out. And Gliza, like, you'll listen to the future episodes and be like, oh, wow, that hair thing was like perfect on brand for what, what's so going cool. on here. So, oh, I love it. The door slides open, and you immediately can tell that this place got water in it. So a little bit of water sloshes out from the newly opened door, and you can see that inside you are in some kind of an antechamber where the ground is just covered in algae. This room is pitch black, smells horribly of mold. You can see many different types of fungus attached to the walls and the ceiling, some of which, once the light touches them, begin to recede a little bit, because this might be, for the purposes of these fungus, this might be the first time they've ever actually seen sunlight, ever. And you step inside, assailed by the smell, and you see two things. You see a giant set of double doors that apparently are how you get into the physical tomb. And then you also see two skeletons laying at the base of the doors. Hmm. What do you do? It is also dark as hell in here. I think just for good measure, hmm. Gubin is going to throw glitter at both the skeletons. Just to make sure. All right, the skeletons are glittered, so that, that's, yeah. that box is checked. I have death sense. Basically, I'm going to see the general nature of how they were killed. How did they die? It's a, it's an ability. Yeah. Okay, you know how they died, is what you're saying? Yeah. 
so basically you can sense the location where any creatures died as well as the general na nature of their death whether they were they were killed by natural causes an accident or foul play so there's actually quite a few things getting stacked on these poor guys <laughs> the bones despite having been waterlogged for a very long time show evidence of having been incinerated Ooh. So that's thing number one thing number two is one of them had its skull bashed in you presume prior to death you think this might have been the thing that killed it, not something that happened after. The other one, you can't find necessarily any evidence on the skeleton itself, but your magic sort of intuition tells you that the other skeleton was eviscerated. Mm. They died very painful deaths. Yes. These were yep. violent deaths. Very, very violent deaths. Did they die in this location? Oddly enough, they did not die in this room. They were moved. Oh, interesting. interesting. Well, this Just... room feels safe because they didn't die here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> is there a thing in quest like a? Most of my knowledge about TTRPGs comes from D and D. So, is there like an investigation check or like a like a general like sensing check, or would that be another ability? I actually have an ability for that. Generally, the way I do is I prioritize whoever has a specific ability that can do it. And Ooh. then we'll go into just like a flat D20 roll to see if you notice anything. So, Bees, did you say you have something for this? Yes. So he's going to reach into his pocket, take out a handful of glitter. Of course. And... <laughs> God bless it. No, Lua. instead of launching it, he's going to put his other hand over it and start mumbling something to himself. And you see just like a glow on the glitter. And then he's going to throw the glitter into his own face. And then when he looks up, his eyes are all like sparkly. And uh, I have magic eye. You briefly gain the ability to see beyond physical reality. For the next hour, you are able to see the following. Magic. A faint aura uh, surrounds any person or object currently affected by magic and illusion. Any illus uh, illusory creature or object slightly flickers, but you do not see its true form. Hmm. Hmm. That's very cool. That is very cool. I will say that there is nothing magical in this room specifically. Mm. However, you can see through the cracks of this old storm door, just the faintest bleed of magical energy emanating from within. There's nothing magical in here, but between those doors in the next room, there are lots of magic, not lots, but there is definitely magical things over there. So. We must be careful as we proceed on, because it may not be good magic, it may be bad magic. Have you been kicked down the door like you did last time? I would love to, but I can't. That is a... That is the stage presence. I see. <laughs> there is no one here to entertain, so I'm not going to do that. You could entertain us. Yes. Mm. Here we are now. Entertain us. I'm so... <laughs> Here we are, entertain us, and he throws glitter at you. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, we're in this room, and there's only one, at least this point, without investigating or whatever much further, it looks like the doors that are locked with the magical sense coming out of it, that is the only potential pathway forward. Correct. Copy. Oh, are there weapons around? I'll say that you're digging around, and you find some rotted rope, and what appears to be mining or climbing equipment that is sort of scattered at the base of this door. It looks like if you kind of inspect some of the scratches along the door, that some of this equipment was maybe used to force these doors open at one time. Hmm. Well, uh, no time like the present. And I'm, I'm gonna go up to the doors. I don't think we've done this yet. I'm gonna like, just see if it opens. And I just wanna like press on it and see if. <laughs> no blood sacrifices. No time. blood sacrifices this time. <laughs> oh, friends, I, I, from my, my many, many adventures, I, I know that once you open one door with blood, the rest of the doors respond to you. So, no need to <laughs> to cut myself again. I'm gonna I'm gonna die if this is a blood activated door. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so, you give it a push, and mm -hmm. then that's when you realize it's an Audi, not an Innie. Ah! <laughs> There's another form of magic that I know from my studies and my travels. Sometimes you have to pull on the door. <laughs> Starts to pull on the, on the slow, slowly, slow. I open the door carefully, carefully. <laughs> Although I did just realize I'm quite reckless, so me a medium open speed. Okay. 
<laughs> we're gonna go with the sort of a graceful opening. Yes. You, you get your fingers in there and you get the feeling that this door was designed to be very, very hard to open. Got it. You can see that it's stone against stone mm -hmm. and there'd be a lot of friction. These doors are very heavy. But one thing has changed since the construction of this tomb, and that is it flooded and is now covered in wet algae and mm. mold and moisture. And so the doors, like, you, once you get your grips in there, they mm. slide open, like, towards you, actually pretty easily sort of gliding across this nasty algae with sort of like a slorpy, goopy sound as you pull it towards you. And let me tell you, once some of that air inside that room gets you, yeah. Oh, it's ten times worse. It is Oof. so bad. This is centuries-old, moldy, nasty, muddy smell. It is bad stuff. Well, that's one. <laughs> oh gosh, uh, that wasn't me. He says, I, "I didn't. I didn't even have to say friend to get that to open. That's wonderful. I was. <laughs> I didn't expect that to work, but I think we've if, if, uh, friends. If, if we are ready for more adventure." And he says it does stink quite, quite badly. Uh, but I think to, to complete this quest, we must continue on in through this door. And he continues opening it up all the way. So you slide it all the way open. Any of you have a source of light or are you just going off of the sunlight coming in from behind you? It did say it was dark. I don't have any abilities for that. I would like to use this opportunity to use my ability called Nature's Watch. Beautiful. <laughs> What's that do? You extend your senses for the next hour. Choose two. And so the two that I would like to choose are Dark Sight, which allows you to see in darkness nearby as if it were dimly lit. Very cool. And Mirror Sight, which allows you to see around corners inside of enclosed spaces like buildings. You must oh. be within reach of the corner. For example, you can see around the bend of a hallway. That's really cool. Love that. That's sick. <laughs> That's super cool. Yeah, you stride inside and with just a little bit of light and, of course, Junebug can really see what's going on in here. Mm -hmm. I will describe the tomb. You are in the tomb chamber. Immediately upon walking in, you see that you are flanked on either side by what appear to be four standing sarcophagi. Uh -oh. The sarcophagi are open right now and there is nothing inside of them. Bless uh -oh. So there's four on either side. Directly in the center of this pretty big tomb chamber is, you would presume, the main sarcophagus. That has been sitting for so long and in such terrible conditions. So the sarcophagus is sitting on like a, a two-layer dais, and then that dais is so heavy that it's actually begun to sink into the ground, mm. right? So it's kind of disturbing the floor. You can see underneath the mold and mud and some of the remaining water that there used to be a meticulously crafted mosaic making up the design pattern on the floor that depicts some kind of battle scene, but it's really hard to tell what's going on because this place is trash. Mm. There are old discarded bones laying just about everywhere in here. And what looks to be the evidence of a few battles. So you can see very plainly that there are several piles of like human skeletons over off to the right side of the tomb. There are weapons, tunics, all that stuff still intact, but rotted over the many, many years. So it looks like you're not the first people to try to breach into this place and take its treasures. And that's when you realize why this tomb is still intact, because standing in the tomb are five intact skeletons. Two of them are standing at the edge of if you'll imagine the standing sarcophagi makes like a row, you know what I mean, going forward, they're standing like gate guards in front of the exit to like those sarcophagi. One of them has a round shield with arrows in it and a bearded ax, and then what appears to be a bushy beard literally growing out of its skeletal jaw. The one standing next to it is slightly shorter and stockier, but the bones appear to be made of kind of a grayish, like almost stone-like material. And they're much thicker. They're very thick bones. Very strong, hearty individual this one is. Behind them, standing next to the sarcophagus, is a skeleton 
that is only holding a tarnished, broken, old silver sword. So you can see that the it's it's basically a silver sword that got snapped in half and mm-hmm. is very tarnished and dull and doesn't look terribly combat ready. It's standing on the dais, holding its hands about six inches above the sarcophagus, very reverently at the moment. At its feet, standing next to it in an obedient manner, is the skeleton of what appears to be a pretty big freaking dog, like a warhound. Oh, no. And it is wearing a fur coat. They took a fur cloak and draped it over this skeleton. It's not, yeah. And so it's wearing this, like, fur coat like a cape. And it has a bronze dagger in its mouth, like Sif from uh, Dark Souls. (laughs) On the other side of the sarcophagus is one final skeleton, so there's five skeletons in total, is a being with a battered up sword and a tattered looking cloak. And it is leaning against the sarcophagus with its arms crossed, kind of like sort of like an edge lowered skeleton. <laughs> and as you're comprehending this scene, the skeleton with the shield and the bearded axe immediately comes to life and bum rushes you. Everyone roll initiatives. Hell yeah. yeah. Let's go glitter. Glitter. Glitter attack first. Goobin, the adequate, what do you do on your turn as this this skeleton with the axe is like charging you already? Okay, I will, oh no, they don't have a mind. Yeah, all right, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna wait for it. So I'm gonna tell you this. You actually can use mind affecting stuff on these skeletons. Awesome. Does this count as a minion? These are minion. Okay. So quest is divided up generally between commoners, minions, and bosses. Commoners are like really easy cannon fighter. Minions are a little tougher. Bosses are tougher still. So these are all minion. So as it rushes up. <laughs> oh my God. I just, I can't escape. So yeah. As the uh, creature goes up, I reach in my pocket for my trusty uh, glitter. I put my hand over like I did with the other spell, uh, whisper something, and then when it gets close, I just, I I flourish a bird and then throw the glitter in its face. And I will cast Mesmerize. Ah. So I dazzle a nearby commoner or minion with an optical illusion. The creature must be able to see Until you leave the area, the creature cannot move, take actions, or respond to conversation. The spell ends if the creature is harmed. Arrow shield skeleton is basically functionally out of the combat. Yeah! It it cannot do anything. It is so confused. I have stopped this. I have taken it out of its aggressive nature. Just don't hit it or it will attack us again. I would describe it as still very much aggressive, but it is so blinded and disoriented that it's basically just sort of like swinging randomly at just like whatever. And it's like hitting walls and it's like wandering around the tomb, like trying to get purchase in anything. But it's so far away from you all now that like it's 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 literally completely without threat. Well, it does say until I leave the area, it cannot move or take action. Oh, it can't move. Then it's just flailing wildly, but it actually can't move around right now. (laughs) (laughs) Very good. Uh, June, it is your turn. June Bud. Yes. I would like to use my ability called Thorn. Ooh. And there's no AP cost for it. You open your palm, conjuring a poisonous thorn that you shoot in a straight line toward a nearby target, creature, or object. The thorn hits for two HP, but I can roll the die, and if it lands on a 20, the poison is amplified. If it's an organic creature, skin becomes swollen, it can't see beyond its reach, and it can't speak or cast spells until the end of its next turn. These aren't organic because they are skeletons. Okie dokie. Well, I guess they're organic, but they're not like that poison would not work on them. That being said, you can still damage them with the thorn. Yes. Who are you targeting? I will target, I guess I'll target whichever one is closest to me. That's going to be the one that has bones of stone. Ooh. Stone bones. Stone bones. Stone bones. Sounds like a wrestling name. You hit it with the thorn, and the thorn doesn't sink in. It plinks off of its armor. Oh, it plinks no. off of its, like, stony bones. It does take damage, but it is reduced by one because this guy has armor. Oh, no. Technically an armor rating. Carbon, your turn. This might be a little bit useless, but 
I have an ability called the bricolage. I can basically use things around me to, to fight and do stuff. So he quickly spins around, cape flo- flowing and flapping behind him, pulls his hood up in a very Gotham Knight sort of way. Something around him on the ground, like some sort of like, maybe a bit of like broken glass from one of the sarcophaguses or some sort of like crunchy sounding something and quickly like turns and throws it across like the entrance to the door they just walked in and that'll basically just act as like a little alarm in case anyone tries to like walk through that in the next minute you can create an auditory trigger that makes noise when someone crosses it so basically just in case someone starts to like if anyone tries to sneak in behind us like those two skelly boys we just left we gotcha. will have a little bit of notice and i think that's all i can do for the for that turn yep quest combat moves really fast very cool reginald I'm going to put people to sleep. That mm. can work, right? I don't think you'll be able to put these things to sleep, but tell me what the description is. So I whisper a brief lullaby, putting any number of nearby commoners to sleep for up to one hour. Creatures affected by the spell collapse and enter a dreamful state. Hmm. So that's probably not going to work. Would you like to use a different ability or maybe take something else? So I have corrupt. Well, they're an organic creature. What's it do? And we'll kind of, we'll sort of vibe it out. Grip an organic creature within reach and create a necrotizing wound. And the wound turns flesh black, green, and branches out from where you touch them. Yeah, we can make it like a bone wound instead. I can get with that. I can get with that. Okay. I will do that and hit the same one that my sister hit. Basically, I'm going to parkour near it and touch it. What is the effect of this? Like, what happens to it? What's the actual mechanical outcome? So the spell hits for one HP immediately, and again, at the beginning of the target's next turn, another one. Okay. So you see this infection begin to seep into the bones, and sort of like the the stony shell begins to, like, crackle as this thing is not holding together very well. But now it is the skeleton's turn. Oh, boo. The silver-sworded skeleton comes to life, pulls its blade, and rushes the party. When it hits the back of the stone bone skeleton, it actually <laughs> leaps up, planting one foot in the hip bone, one foot on the shoulder. The agility of this creature is unbelievable. It dives over top of the stone skeleton, and in a spinning motion directly over Reginald's head, goes in to slash at Junebug. Oh, no. 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 Not June bug. Oh, wait. Oh, what do you got? I have a reaction. <laughs> okay. I can use two AP to encase my armor or clothing with a chitinous shell that absorbs up to 10 hit points of damage. Nice. If you Whoa. are hit by a non-magical weapon, the weapon shatters to pieces. Oh, oh wow. <laughs> wow. I love that. That's super cool. Yeah, so this thing like dives out at you. So it also rolled a tough choice. So you can choose to take damage and deal damage or put it in a compromising position. Well, my reaction is going to absorb up to 10 hit points, so I will put it in a compromising position. <laughs> okay, I mean, you can deal damage to it too as well. If you like. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> do you want to? Or do you want compromising position? No, nope, okay. I'll do a compromising position. Okay, so it does this spinning maneuver, hits your armor and the silver sword shatters. It just keeps on like following through with the swing and then the sword shatters utterly in its hand. What is the compromising position you would like to put this creature in? I would like it. So as it swings through and goes to like try to hit me, but obviously the sword shatters as it as it passes through. It's almost like surprised by the fact that it didn't hit me and it kind of like throws it off balance and it stumbles closer to somebody who can do more damage. <laughs> mm. Mm. Okay. So it will be easier to hit, basically, I think. Yeah. I think it's That's sort of cool. open to an attack. Yeah, I like that. Okay. Yeah. The skeleton in the cloak rushes up, stands with its stone bone skeleton friend, and attempts to stab Reginald with its old nasty sword. Rolled a tough choice, so do you want to take damage and deal damage, or put it in a compromising position, Reginald? Put it in a compromising position. All right, so you will take two damage. Well, it'll be one damage. You'll take, yeah, you'll take one damage from this. And then what is the compromising position you would like to put this skeleton in? 
it would fall on its butt. Okay, it is now prone. It slips on the algae and like plop. Yes. It is at this point that the stone bone skeleton goes after Reginald. No, Reginald. Not Reginald. Oh no. Fine. These skeletons are rolling dog, dog shit dice here. Take damage and deal damage or put it in a compromising position. Let's go, Reginald. I will deal damage with this one. You will deal damage. What is your weapon? What do you have for a weapon? I have a bow and dagger. A bow and a dagger. So you come at it with the dagger. Yeah, I'm going to come at it with a dagger. What does it look like when you kill a skeleton made of stone with a dagger? What does that look like? (laughs) So I will aim to pierce what I think where its heart would be. Hmm. And what it would do is it would start to crack and it would fall apart. It doesn't turn into dust, but just like crash into like this little bits of stone. Just kind of yeah. collapses. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah that's what I would Very do. cool. As you thrust the knife in and it starts to fall apart, you see it, very peculiar thing happens. You see it sort of cast its, it turns its head not towards you, but towards the skeleton with the shield. And it just kind of looks at it for just a split second before finally losing all of the necromantic energy that was sustaining it and collapsing into a pile of rock. As that flashes through their thoughts, they turn towards Sammy, wanting to say something. Nice. Top of the order, Goobin. Goobin. The dog doesn't do anything. It sits at the edge of the sarcophagus. Okay. So then let's uh, let's do a quick little rewind. Because my magic eye lasts an hour, mm-hmm. can I know all the, the fate aura surrounding any person or object that's affected by magic? And if there's any illus- uh, illusory creatures, they flicker. All of these creatures are magical mm-hmm. to one extent or another. You also notice that the axe, hmm, no, not the axe, the sword in the hand of the cloak, the tattered cloak skeleton, is also faintly magical. Okay. And there is really nothing else magical. You can see the faint evidence that there is magic underneath the sarcophagus. Did I notice any magic transfer from the stone skeleton to the other one as it collapsed since it just stared? You did not see any sort of magical transfer between those two. Okay. So it's just like, I'm going to die. It's up to you. Peace, bye. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) See you, buddy. (laughs) What would you like to do with your turn? Agubin. All right. So we have the stone skeleton drop. We have the cloak skeleton and the now swordless skeleton. Yes. And the butt skeleton. The one that's on its butt. So both the swordless skeleton and the cloak skeleton are in vulnerable positions. Got it. So we'll say they take one extra damage. Very cool. So then what I will do is I will, yeah, I think I'm just gonna, my staff and just spin it around my head and go, (gasps) chill lightly. Boom. (laughs) (laughs) Which one are you hitting? I will hit the one with the magic sword. One cloak one, right? Yep, roll 20. A nine, that is a tough choice. Yeah. You can either take damage and deal damage or be put in a compromising position. Uh, everybody's playing it safe. Bump that. Let's take and deal. Let's take and deal. Here. Take and yeah. deal. So two damage to the cloak skeleton. It doesn't have armor. And then you also take two damage as it slashes you along the leg with its bronze sword. Does it take three because of the compromising position? It takes three because it's compromised, yeah. yeah. Nice. So this thing is in trouble. It is not doing so hot. Goobin, that was your turn. Junebug. Junebug. I would like to use another thorn. Okay. Who are you hitting? Yeah. Who do we still have left? Tattered Cloak Skeleton, which is almost dead. And okay. And you have the former Silver Sword Skeleton, which is compromised right now but it hasn't been wounded yet. Okay, I will go for the guy in the cloak. (laughs) Cloak. Yep. No roll here, you just shoot it? 
correct. Boom. For two AP, so, or for uh, two damage, so. Would you like to describe how the thorn ends this skeleton? Yeah! Yeah! yeah. Let's see. So I managed to shoot the thorn directly between where his eyes would be. <laughs> and it just <laughs> shatters his skull. And she remembers that to the last time when she woke and she stepped beyond the boundary of what she said she would always be in. She realizes that after all this time, she's failed. Like the slow-mo? Yeah. And when you play those sniper games? Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Carbon. The only skeleton that is a threat that is active right now is the one that had the silver sword. The dog hasn't done anything. Because he's a good boy. Because he's Don't touch the dog. Reginald wants to pet it. Got it. Okay. <laughs> I was going to do that, but now that I know that, I will not do that. Oh, sorry. The knife in the dog's mouth is also magical. Might be. I forgot that part. How dare you forget something after remembering a thousand million things. No, you're doing fine. <laughs> At a, a quick glance, does it look like... Because you said there's there's five sarco- sarcophagi standing up, and there's one in the middle of the room? There are eight standing sarcophagi, and then one in the middle that is not standing. And is that one open? No, it is not open, but you get Good. the feeling that's the important one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Then I think what I want to try and do is... I would like to use... Well, what does the ceiling of this room look like? Gross. Why? What are you trying to what are you trying to pull off? I have a grappling hook. I want to try to get over to that big big boy sarcophagi. Okay. I was gonna throw it at the ceiling and check the Tarzan over there. That would not be hard to do. In fact, you could probably take a free the unarmed skeleton as well. Oh, give okay. him a good kick while you're doing that if you want. Can I try to kick him into one of this upright open sarcophagi? Oh, that'd be sick, yeah, go for it. Yeah, roll me twenty here. Cool. Do some swashbuckling. Swashbuckling. For handsome Jack. Hand, for handsome Jack. A 12? A 12. A 12 is a success. Yeah. 11 through 19 is a success. Nice. So, yeah, you boot this thing into the open sarcophagus. It takes one damage from getting booted, and then you are able to land next to the prominent sarcophagus. You're actually next to the skeleton dog where you land. And it looks up at, up at you with the knife, and then its tail starts to wag a little bit. It's a little skeleton hit tail. I love it. Reginald, I need you over here. And that'll be your turn. Reginald, it's your turn. Reginald sees the wagging tail and just brushes to the dog. So now want to hug it. Completely nice. ignoring the still <laughs> extant threat of the... <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes, that is, that is correct. Reginald, you notice that the dog is like looking between both of you and like gets up off of its butt and just sort of stands and like wags its tail and like clearly wants attention while it's still holding a knife in its mouth. Reginald would <laughs> hug this giant. Is How big is this dog? It's a wolf. This is a wolf size. This is a big honking dog. Reginald will hug this dog and just be like, who's a good boy? <laughs> Wait, who's a good boy? It's just like hugging it and petting it. And that's what that, that's what I'll do. I'll that's your, Reginald uses his action to pet Who's a good boy? Walk the dog. press X to pet dog. Yeah, yeah, that is exactly what Reginald does. There is only one active threatening skeleton, and that is the one that is currently unarmed and slightly wounded. It will take a swing at Junebug, because Junebug's right there. I think Junebug's right there. Yeah, Junebug's right there. It rolled a 12. Junebug, you take a single damage. Oh, no, you have the absorption thing. I do. (laughs) It rakes you with its claws. The claws don't fall apart because it is held together with magic, so you don't, like, disintegrate its hand. But, of course, your your shield just sort of absorbs it. Yeah. So it did its, like, big, super cool move, and now it seems to be sort of petering out of energy. It's almost like you can, in fact... Gubin, with your magic eyes going, you can see some of the necromantic aura around it literally drifting out of its form like wisps, like little tendrils of blackness going just into the ether. It appears to be losing its connection with the world right now. It's very sad. This is not happening, by the way, to the other two skeletons in the room that are active, just this specific one. 
while the dog enjoys getting pet. It's having a good time, but it is Gubin's turn. Okay. Yeah, so as it's, I see it fading. Yeah, I think we're just going to rinse and repeat, you know, with all the fury I can muster. And by that, I'm like, you will die next. And then uh, swing at it and hit it. Let her rip. Let her rip. Yeah, I changed my F into a Beyblade and I just fired at it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, Nat 20, baby. Oh, that's what? a triumph. So my staff does turn into a Beyblade. Yeah, so you shatter this thing. Yeah. If you'd like, I'll give you the option for a two-for-one here. What do you want your triumph to be here, though? What do you want the big... I think I would like to... Because they want us to clear this place out. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have to deal with the other skeleton that's just in the corner kind of moshing. Yeah, um, <laughs> doing his best. <laughs> oh, I forgot yeah. about that one. Yeah, yeah. So, I want to take this one out, and since the dog poses no threat, my next target would be that one. So I would like to kind of put myself in, or uh, well, and or my party in an advantageous position to take it out. I mean, I'll literally let you kill this thing right now. Well, then let's do that. That's oh, fantastic. Like, I mean, it's, it's got a 20. That's like the threats are pretty much over. Like, what's it like? How are you two for wanting this bad boy? Let's go. All right. So he walks up to it as it's like, <gasps> and he's just like, the end shall come for you and mm -hmm. all of yours alike. Mm -hmm. Look at me and fear, feel despair. Goodbye. And he just like takes the staff, swings, hits it, and then looks over at the other one and he's like, I forgot about you. And just like <laughs> kicks the head up. <laughs> As the head's in the air floating, he goes, Wait, something's missing. <laughs> Throws glitter on it and then swings his staff like a baseball bat and slams it right into the. Uh, into the other skeleton's head and just shatters both heads. Oh my god. Both oh my god. In an explosion of bone and glitter. Yeah, both skulls like shatter and the, the skeletons just completely collapse as Sammy the Coward charges headlong, screaming into the ears of his compatriots. He thinks back to his first battle. He just curls up in the trench, holding his lance and lets everyone else die for him. Years fly by like dead leaves. Everything is darkness, everything is silent. You stand vigilant before the sarcophagus without thought or breath, such is your compulsion. You do not remember your name and still you stand watch. The flesh has fallen off your bones and still you watch. You'll never be alive again, but in this moment, in the chaos between violation and destruction, you truly live. You remember what you once were, and you taste the sun. And there is a brief moment of silence. As Reginald, you feel the skeleton dog pull away from you. Oh, no. Oh, why? Kind of shimmies back a little bit, like dog do. And it sits down very politely. And then it takes that bronze dagger that was in its mouth, and it sets it down at your feet. At my feet? Yeah, at your feet, Reginald. And then it curls up into a little doggy skeleton croissant shape. Mm -hmm. And Gubin, you see the magic from it just fade away. The next time I wake up, will there be another master? Yep. Yeah. What a good boy. Aww. So good news and bad news. The good news is the threats are taken care of. The bad news is you can't have that dog. It makes me so sad. No, Can I no. have this dagger thing? So, Reginald, in looking at the dagger, you recognize this dagger. Oh. Reginald, this is your dagger. You can't place where you know this dagger from or why you know this dagger or why it's so important, but you get this feeling in your soul that this is this belongs to you. This is your implement. Now, Reginald, Remember the one rule, 
No, t who am I kidding? Take that freaking dagger, Reginald. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna take this dagger because the dog mm -hmm. gave it to me. It's mine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Reginald, do you scoop up the dagger? Hell yeah! Reginald, the moment you touch the dagger, you die. Oh! Aww. But not really. Rather, what you experience is the briefest moment of the sensation of death. A flash, like in your memory. You're in an open field and you see a hailstorm of arrows coming your way. And then as, as one closes in right on your head, you flash out. And then there's another memory. You're marching with a platoon and you get attacked and you strike down two men with this dagger, the dagger in your hand before you're stabbed through the gut and expire. The memories of the people that have held this weapon in the past flash through your brain. It's incredibly disorienting and everyone watches Reginald really struggling to deal with this. Every time Reginald dies, he goes, ah! ah! <laughs> <laughs> the other thing that happens, Reginald, is you feel younger. You feel as if your bones are encased in like a metallic sheath. Like there's something wrapping around them, hardening and strengthening them. You feel your blood thicken. You feel your heart become youthful. And then finally, Reginald opens his eyes in shock and they are bright, polished bronze Whoa. with little black pupils. And when they dilate, they do that sort of camera shutter thing, just like Philip had. Whoa. Reginald, you know what this is. In the back of your head, you, there is one word echoing in your mind. Brazen. You are brazen. Whoa. Whoa. Um... <laughs> Jude Bug. How do I look? <laughs> <laughs> do I look cool? And, and and I think that's where we'll stop. Yes, yes. <laughs> that's perfect. <laughs> Thank I you would all, like everybody. To... That was Quest. Oh. Thank you, David. Thank you, Beast. Thank you, Luna. Thank you, Gliza. This no was a problem. blast. Thank, Thank you, you listeners Benjamin. to Team Woven. This was just lovely. Really had a great time. Thank you all for taking what was pretty kind of a kind of a of a low-key adventure and making it just so interesting and fun. Thank you for listening to Game Woven. Please give us a follow on Twitter at Game Woven, join the Discord, support us on Patreon, and consider leaving us a review on Apple, Spotify, or whatever host you normally use. This week's episode featured me, T.T. Benjamin, at T.T. Benjamin 1 on Twitter. David Tilstra at David Tilstra on Twitter. Bees at biggest underscore bees, B E A Z, on Twitter. Gliza at classical Gliza, that's G L A I Z A, on Twitter. And Luna at gamermom Luna on Twitter.